so our next, next speaker is um, Pete Muller. Um, Pete Muller is a FACOG and a FRANSCOG and USA FRANSCOG certified maternal fetal medicine subspecialist and is current um, clinical head of maternal fetal medicine at the Women's and Children's Hospital after previously serving as director of women's imaging at the Women's and Children's from 2005 to 2013. After eight years in private practice in obstetrics and gynaecology in Charlotte, North Carolina, Peter underwent the three-year certified fellowship in maternal fetal medicine at Duke University um, Medical Center in Durham, North Carolina. After completion of the fellowship, Peter returned to Adelaide with South Australian-born wife Carol um, in 2004 as senior consultant in obstetrics um, at the Women's and Children's Hospital. Peter has been a visiting consultant to Adelaide Women's Imaging in Adelaide since 2004. Thank you. Um, his clinical interests include both red cell and platelet allo immunisation, fetal surveillance for the com complicated multiple pregnancy and the fetal growth restricted um, fetus, cervical insufficiency, prenatal diagnosis, and as many know, placental pathology as it relates to clinical outcomes. Thanks, Pete. Oh, thanks. So. Yeah. Oh, that's a lot. Um, a couple of things just about Yi Kong. I, I went to a conference um, about 10 or 11 years ago. It was a whole day affair on, on, on the placenta. And um, Yi Kong's name came up about 20 times during the day. I was so proud to be there. It was a very proud moment. Um, all right. So just a little bit about Brian Pridmore. He's a very um, a strong mentor of mine, actually. Um, I didn't know what I wanted to do when I was finished my U.S. training, so I sent a resume to my professor at University of North Carolina, who passed that resume off to, Brian, to John Svigos, who passed that uh, resume on to Brian Pridmore, and all of a sudden, on a 36 straight hours of calls, a Friday night around 6 o'clock, couldn't wait to go home. We got a call at my office uh, where I was working, and there was this doctor from, from Adelaide, South Australia, looking for some money to develop a job there at the QEH. And um, so I'm talking to this person I never met before, even talked to before, Brian Pridmore. He says, please send me some more stuff. So I thought it was very exciting that I could do it by fax, because you could send it out at 5 o'clock at night, and he had it the next morning. I thought that was the most exciting thing in the world with fax. <laughs> and so I took the job. And um, I got here on a Friday afternoon after, like, forever traveling. Brian took me straight to the registration so I could be off work on Monday morning. <laughs> he was like, I let me off. So, and I, the, probably the most fantastic year, and he's probably the most important person I've had because we've met my wife through his. Uh, I've come here to live here pur purposely, and my favorite picture is with the Queen. That was my first day at the QEH, and, and now she's my Queen because I became an Australian citizen last year, so she's my Queen. So, all right. so a diseased fetus without the placenta is an imperfect specimen, and a description of fetal malady unless accompanied by a notice of placental conditions is incomplete. Fetus, the membranes, the cord, placenta, and the organ form an organic whole and disease of any part must react upon and affect the others. He must have seen this before, so it's like um, 1892. So obviously, when somebody asked me to do a talk on the placenta and, and ultrasound, was like a nirvana, man. It's like, my, this is fantastic. It's like a kid for a candy factory. Um, so uh, he's talked a little bit about this. So we talk about the side of the placenta is both the mother and the fetal side uh, of placental circulation, and that'll be a very important in, in discussion. So this is a very nice presentation. just came out in August 2021 by Julie, uh, Julia Unterscheider, who's an MFM down in Melbourne. She talked had a really nice discussion. She talked about trying to simplify placental pathology for myself. There's a vascular side with both maternal and fetal. There's the inflammatory, which can be high-grade velitis of unknown etiology, and there's the real rare lesions. Uh, massive peripheral fibrin deposition and chronic histiocytic intervillositis. I'd almost call those really almost inflammatory kind of as well, actually, for some. So I talk about fetal side, maternal size, and inflammatory placental pathologies. So anybody know what this is? Oh, come on, you're Adelaide people. It's West Lakes. <laughs> and why is that important? Because West Lakes is like a placenta, okay? <laughs> they are, it's, it is really, truly, it's an engineering marvel. I come from the Deep South. One's God-driven, um, and one's done by incredible engineers. And I'll tell you why. Because if you look at there, the spiral arteries. So if you look at that, I went and took this picture on the weekend for this talk. You can see their nice, fresh maternal blood going into the villa, inner villa space, okay? And it's all this fresh, brackish water that comes in, pumped in, okay? and it goes into, the, and the kayakers go in there, and then you have the intervilla space, okay? You have the lake itself, people are swimming, they're peeing in it, they're all doing all kinds of things, and, and everyone's having a good time in there, and it's just kind of bathing the entire West Lakes, okay? 
but it has to go out, it has to recircle. So then it goes out maternal legs and leaves the maternal circulation, what we call placental legs. So you can see here, that looks like a placenta. Look at that. So it's right here, it goes out, it looks just like placental legs. So when you talk about placental legs, it is exactly where it goes back into it and it refreshes itself. So it's a really engineering marvel, just like the placenta. So next time you talk to a patient, it's just like West Lakes. <laughs> I say that all the time, patients love that stuff. You probably have patients love that. So this is just a waste like this is West Lakes Alley. You can see the way it's going back into the maternal circulation here, okay? All right, you just kind of see it sloshing back, going back into the outlet to get back into maternal circulation. So fetal growth restriction is one of the things we look for quite frequently, obviously. And so fetal growth can be SGA babies, majority of a majority of small for gestational age babies are not growth restricted. Major a lot of AGA babies are growth restricted, and our job is to try to detect those. That's the hardest one to detect, whether well, an AGA baby that's clearly not reaching its, its, its uh, potential. So what's the difference between SGA and, and fetal growth restriction? One's a pathological condition, and one is just SGA, most likely not pathological. And that's where we have a difficulty t testing for. And that's where the placenta can be very helpful. Now, Brian Tudinger was a MFM in, in cities, uh, must be retired by now, but really a landmark in using fetal dopplers for maternal circulation um, and determining um, growth through the fetuses. And it's all about the downstream resistance to flow and what we call Doppler velocimetry. So this is, he did these pictures where he, he took a placenta that was a normal placenta put some um, acrylic dyes through that placenta, and this is what he's talking about with the, the, the fetal circulation. These are all fetal villi going through, and that's when you have a normal umbilical artery Doppler. And then you have here, well, you know, placental insufficiency, where you have that same a placenta that's really quite abnormal, severe growth restriction, and that's the fetal circulation. You can see that there's loss of, of villi there, uh, and that's where you get the reverse endostop flow. And so it's quite interesting. It's almost like kidney disease. If you have to, to get abnormal umbilical artery dopplers, you have to lose about 80% of your villi to do it. It's like kidney disease. You have to learn a certain amount of nephrons before your creatinine goes up. And so it really is about 80% before you see the, uh, the PI or the resistance in the umbilical arteries go up. Um, and there's two different pathologies. There's probably a very different pathology between early onset growth restriction which is usually significant placental pathology versus late onset. Early onset, you'll get the abnormal fetal dopplers very, very early, and the transition and evolution of that disease is actually be quite quick. And we see that all the time. Admit somebody with severe high growth restriction, within a couple of weeks they're delivered. So in four to six weeks they're delivered. And so we have a kind of a typical stepwise approach of fetal dopplers to see the changes. But usually the placental doppler at waveforms are usually the, the, on the abnormal ones, okay? Late onset's very different. So late onset is the things that we see, and this is what we worry about, we talk about stillbirth, is our interest to, to, to prevent the late stillbirth or the late preterm stillbirth by looking at things. And that's very difficult because your Dopplers may not be so abnormal. To have abnormal Dopplers like I talked about, you have to have 80% of your placental uh, circulation gone, your fetal circulation gone before you have abnormal, significant abnormal Dopplers. But it may be the late onset growth restriction is more a relative placental insufficiency. It is a baby's metabolic demand, the placenta can't grow fast enough, it's not growing fast enough to make up for what the, the metabolic demand of that baby. That's why diabetic babies die, because they actually don't have placental insufficiency, their metabolic demand is so high that they outgrow their placental demand. So, and so late onset is very different, and that's the one we really struggle trying to discover, because you know, what do you do with some of these Dopplers? So I think the ultrasound of placenta is interesting, and, and one of the things I've noticed from this talk is I, I go back and look at some pictures, and I've realized how few pictures my sonologists and sonographers take of the placenta when they have abnormal Dopplers. The first thing I do is I hear those abnormal Dopplers, I look at the placenta and take a bunch of pictures of the placenta, but a lot of colleagues don't even think about it, they just look at the Dopplers, because I think that'd be quite helpful. This was an old-fashioned thing, we don't really look at this very much now, we call it advanced, uh, he probably remembers this type of stuff that would be very popular, was grade one, grade two, and you can kind of see a uh, placenta that's normal, then grade one, you might have a little random kind of ecogenicities, and then you have some basal ecogenic areas in the base, and you can start seeing your cotyledons. The cotyledons are a certain number of branch, main branch 
um, uh, fetal arteries uh, uh, that go to the certain edges of the placenta. And you can see now, you can see echopore densities, and we're going to show pictures of that to a grade, what we call grade three. So this is a patient who came in for a routine scan at 30, I can't remember if she was like 32, 33 weeks, and had significant what we call cerebral redistribution. So what that means is that baby's compensating by improving the blood supply to the, uh, the brain. And, there's, and the umbilical arteries are, are elevated. So, um, but there, there's not forward, there's forward flow, and oh, what, do you, what does that mean at 32, 33 weeks? And this is a concept of looking at, so looking at the placenta. So you look at a placenta here, and you can start seeing the development of those cotyledons. You normally can't see at 31, 32 weeks, and actually we use a placenta looks all homogeneous, but you actually can see, and when you're going through that, see the cotyledons there, and there's a cotyledon with a dropout in the middle. And we do uterine, because I do that, you see that, oh, I think I'll do uterine Dopplers. This whole concept that you have to do uterinary Dopplers at 20 weeks or 24 weeks is no good afterwards is really false. Quite clearly, if a placenta function diminishes dramatically because of infarctions or other things, that you'll get abnormal uterine placental circulation, and Dopplers can be helpful. Even this patient actually had normal uterinary Dopplers at 20 weeks and very abnormal Dopplers, uh, uterinary Dopplers now. So that's, I'm trying to get that across, they can be performed, I find very helpful. So this is a patient I just scanned on, I was looking for a talk, so I just scanned her on, on Friday, and I was seeing, oh, there's some good pictures for my talk, and um, I started talking to her, and I said, I said, well, yeah, well, how did you last time? Well, I delivered a little bit early, so what was that? I had preeclampsia, and of course, she's 31 weeks, and I'm going, oh, okay, that's a bit fair. Looks, looks right. So you can start seeing the cotyledons. She's only 31 weeks, but you can start seeing the cotyledons starting to form, aren't you? The little dropouts there. So that doesn't mean something's there, and we'll talk about what these things are, but there's already some what I call early maturation of the placenta that we typically wouldn't see at 31 weeks. And this is kind of what happens. So this is basically what you can see here is kind of, this is a low flow kind of flow. And so what's most likely happened here is we talk about an intervillous thrombus and reperfusion. This is reperfusion of intervillous thrombus with maternal blood. So you can see this going into that space. You can see the blood going into that space in a slow manner from a, probably an intervillous thrombus that has occurred. Okay. And this is what it kind of looks like, you know, afterwards. So you can kind of see a little defect, a little defect there. And I'm hoping this will work. And so, so you can see the fluid coming out of the placenta there. You can see that's an intervillous thrombus. So that actually correlates to what we saw on ultrasound. Very different than placental lakes. A lot of radiologists don't understand, sometimes don't understand this. They'll see this, and they call it placental lakes. But if it's in the middle of the cotyledon like that, it's got a little bit of hyperacroquine, that's not a placental lake. Okay, and we know we talk. He talks about we talk about the intervillous thrombus are, are quite seen quite frequently in healthy babies at birth. But if you see abnormal Dopplers and see that, or we have elevated blood pressures or something of that nature, it lets you let you kind of look at those things. And this is a much worse worse approach for a little placenta like this with abnormal Dopplers. Quite clearly, that placenta looks quite abnormal. So, and this is a kind of a placenta that we've seen before. So this one on the right, you can actually see. The little dark area in the middle, a little intervillous thrombus, you can almost see the cotyledons already separate from a preterm placenta. And you can see an infarction on that placenta as well, and the one on the right. That's just a delivery we've done very recently. And you can see these are, these are thrombi or, or infarctions that are occurring within the placenta um, that's already occurred. So it correlates, ultrasound does correlate with the Dopplers and sometimes correlates with the actual placental pathology. So this is a patient where it helps us. So this is when I this is a grab one pair of zero three three weeks for follow up ultrasound for renal pelvic dilation, and so you're kind of doing a scan in some normal antenatal care. She's doing pretty good. Just coming for us, look at the kidneys, and we look at that. And the baby do the graph, looking pretty good. The baby's not too too small, but we kind of look at we look at real quickly at her measurements and what we call asymmetric growth. Now asymmetric growth by itself with no other intervening, is, has no predictive of adverse pregnancy outcome, but it piques your interest, doesn't it? So, okay, there you can see that the baby's really only the, on the 14th percentile, the belly's really at the 6th percentile, while the head's at the 82nd percentile, so it piques your interest. Oh, okay, it piques my interest. So I'm gonna look, where am I gonna look? I'm gonna look at the placenta. So our umbilical artery doppers were pretty normal, and now fluid's pretty normal, pretty happy about those things. So what do I do? I look at the placenta, okay? So you can really see the cotyledons there. You can see the, this is a very advanced grade three placenta at 32 weeks, very typical for 32 weeks. So I said, oh, you know, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna do some MCA Dopplers. So I do some MCA Dopplers, quite significant brain sparing. Okay, this baby's doing cerebral redistribution. So this is probably an AJ baby who's got fetal growth restriction. So I made that diagnosis based on those findings. Um, so I was kind of a foreigner. I've been only been here for a little while. A couple of, I called the private doc. It wasn't you? Probably called the private doc. They didn't know who I was. They kind of blew me off. 
But I just talked to the patient before she was leaving. I said, look, you know, I'm just worried about the placenta. If you have, just monitor the baby's movements and so forth. And sure enough, she called her doctor about six days later, presented with decreased fetal movement, had a terribly abnormal CDG, had a core pH of 6.99. So I think we saved that baby by talking about fetal movements. Otherwise, she probably would have sat at home for a little while and it was fine. So there was some quite things. That placenta was very help, helpful to me to, to diagnose fetal growth restriction. What about thick stubby placentas? We see these quite frequently as well, the thick stubby placentas, or, or I sometimes will say, um, uh, uh, in, you know, kind of a large placenta. And so, although I borrowed this picture from you, but this is classic. So this is more of a fetal, mat, that, this, this patient had what we call fetal vascular malperfusion, which was basically, she had a very, very, very long cord, incredibly long cord, I've never seen one that long. Um, and it was developments or marginal cord insertion. And that can lead to fetal um, vascular malperfusion based on poor uh, placental nets. We'll talk about the recurrence risk for that in a minute. And this is a late onset IGR that we've just recently delivered. So this is a patient who a GP sent us down at AWI for some, you know, all the babies just had a routine growth or whatever, and then Dopplers were a little bit elevated, and so he sent her down there. And, and sure enough, you know, the umbilical arteries showed elevated resistance in umbilical artery. The MCA shows significant brain sparing, so it kind of catches our eye a little bit. Um, and that's the growth trajectory. Quite abnormal, okay, quite abnormal. And we look at the placenta. Not a lot there, but it just kind of catches your eye, some echogenicities to it. It doesn't have kind of the cotyledons, but just a bit thick and, and looks a little, catches your eye a little bit. If a normal growth, I wouldn't have even looked at it that in great detail, but it just kind of catches my eye. And of course, deliver the baby uh, because it really early, I think 35, 35 weeks or so. It was IGR. And so this is what we're talking about. It's kind of a rare intervillous histiocytic inter uh, infiltrate. So history, um, excuse me, intervillous histiocytic intervillositis, which is a rare type of, uh, of uh, placental inflammatory abnormality that can lead to recurrent pregnancy loss early on, can lead to very early onset severe growth restriction, but also can occur in late onset growth, you know, growth restriction for, for, as well. So I think looking at that placenta and sending the pathology was very helpful to this couple. It would be very helpful to this couple. So this is, again, going back to that article, and I think this has really helped me kind of guide me a little bit about different, because you'll get some placental pathology, and you'll look at it, and say, what does that mean? And you'll call Yi, or you call one of his colleagues, who are very, very, we are very fortunate to have such great placental pathologists in this town. We probably very few places would have the level of that. Um, so we talk about maternal vascular malperfusion, pl small placenta. This is more the maternal circulation, the, the preeclamptic, you know, patients. You get um, accelerated maturation, early onset IGR, preeclampsia, autoimmune disease, APLS, chronic hypertension, and they'll have the abnormal urinary dopplers, okay? And there's an increased recurrence risk, but not a usually so, depending on what disease they have. It's a, but it's an increased recurrence risk. And you talk about low-dose aspirin in future therapy. But then you have the fetal, um, fetal, uh, fetal vascular malperfusion patients who, who are either velamentous cord, we talk about hypocoiled or hypercoiled cords or velamentous cord insertion, uh, lead to small placentas uh, and more of the fetal component of it. Um, they get some true knots, single umbilical artery, um, avascular villi, and this is more of the kind of patients you might see for late onset IUGR, SGA, or IUFD in the third trimester, or fetal distress, or neonatal encephalopathy because of, of an intrapartum event. And that's actually quite a small recurrence risk, not zero, but actually quite a small recurrence because these patients you can say, look, this was a placental issue. I tell the patients, placentas are like snowflakes, okay? They're all a little bit different. There's no one ever the same, especially monochromatic twins. <laughs> And then you have the inflammatory, the high-grade velitis with IGR adverse neonatal cow comes up. Recurrence risk is higher for that because etiology may be an autoimmune response, 10 to 20 percent. The rare, the massive paravillus fibrin deposition, maternal floor infarction, much higher recurrence risk. And the one I showed you, the chronic histiocytic intervasitis, a very high recurrence risk. Not inevitable, but a high recurrence of 67 percent, and a bunch of differences on what you on what you treat for that. So this is a nice little. Uh, thing that I use, it simplifies, and I hope it's not too bad to you, but it kind of simplifies how I look at placentas and how I take care of that patient in the next pregnancy. I'm sure there's other options for that. So the old child placenta gives many clues in the health of the fetus. It's, it's not just whether it's low line or not. If you see something abnormal, look at the placenta and take some pictures of the placenta. If you feel the placenta looks funny, look elsewhere, Dopplers, color, transvaginal, uterine arteries, and so forth. And uh, thank you very much for your time.